Benjamin, welcome to Developer Nation broadcast. How are you doing today? Good, very good. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm actually having a fanboy moment here because uh, I have been following your work for almost over a decade. I remember like I was uh, in university. I think it was my second year of undergrad engineering and IoT was a very hot thing uh, back then. Everyone was talking about millions and billions of devices going to be connected <laughs> to the internet by 2020. And uh, I wanted to, you know, make, uh, I wanted to do some projects. I wanted to test what this field is all about. Uh, and a lot of white papers were there. A lot of uh, texts were there, but there were, there were very few people who were actually making projects out of it. And you happened to be one of them. Uh, I remember, I think you were in Eclipse and you were doing a lot of uh, MQTT stuff. I remember your uh, IoT greenhouse uh, project that you were taking from one conference to another. And that was a huge inspiration. It was having IoT, it was having augmented reality. Uh, I remember you also hosted a contest with Element 14, which I was part of uh, Enchanted IoT Devices, something like that. Uh, yeah, you're bringing back some really good memories, yeah. actually. Um, yeah. yeah cool. Right. And uh, Arduino Yun, uh, it, was, it was still very much recent, and you were the first one uh, who did a lot of uh, examples with RGB. And even till this day, I'm like... Uh, uh, very much uh, go back and look back to the blogs that you have published uh, at that time, 2013, 2014, we are talking about. Uh, so we're going to be capturing a lot about that in your career journey. But uh, for view, uh, for listeners, like if you could give a small introduction, uh, what do you do and what are the projects that you're currently working on? So let's start there. So yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned that you've been sort of in touch uh, yeah. from, from a distance uh, for the past decade or so. Um, yeah, so I'm Benjamin and I've been doing IoT or even M2M, I guess. That's kind of like the, the inside joke. Yeah, I was doing yeah. IoT when it was still called machine to machine. Uh, so yeah, I've um, I'm based in France, been doing lots of open source and all things connected devices for pretty much my entire career. Like you basically, I mean, you're sort of like the exact uh, demonstration of that. My What I'm trying to accomplish basically is to uh, inspire developers to uh, build cool solutions with technology and find the right balance between, and this is very true in IoT, find the right balance between something that's actually useful and, and that works and that's solving a real problem versus something that might be just like this idea of what it could be like in 20 years from now, when you, you get everything right, like you do big data, blah, 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 you combine all the keywords you can, but then you cannot really accomplish anything useful because you're just uh, trying to, um, yeah, you're thinking to complicate it. So the greenhouse you mentioned, and yeah. maybe we can talk more later, but, uh, that was actually, um, I have like a, a fun anecdote that I, uh, you just reminded me of. Uh, so this was, I guess, yeah, 2014, I think you got that right. Uh, I was building a, a demo uh, or a tutorial, uh, both, I guess, on how to use MQTT and how to connect a device to, to the internet so that you could extract some useful data and greenhouse, like you want to monitor the humidity, the temperature, that's, depending on how you look at it, it's either a lot of things or it's maybe too simple because it's just like, you're only talking one greenhouse, a couple um, um, sensor values. And so when I was sort of pitching this demo and making it available to, to developers, some people like you, I guess, were really excited about it. And then interestingly, my employer at the time, and even like people in industry, some people were like, yeah, no, this is, this is not Fortune 500. Like this is not what IoT is all about. Really? Yes, it is. Like it starts there. If you cannot uh, make that work, like kind of like the hello world, uh, IoT 101 kind of scenario, then you're not going to get your billions of devices, mm. big data, AI, whatever. It starts there. Uh, and so that's always what I'm trying to do. And same, um, like these days for the past year or so, uh, I'm now working, um, at the Linux foundation for the Zephyr project, which I'm sure we will going to talk about. And that's the same. I mean, Zephyr is like a, a huge beast, but still starts with the hill world for getting people hooked and getting people to understand what it's all about. You need to get those simple scenarios, right? Otherwise it just doesn't work. 100%. You know, like that was such a all round 360 demo. It has uh, sensors, temperature and humidity. I also remember it has a servo to open the top part yeah. uh, of the greenhouse. And then you also end up building a mobile application that has augmented reality built into. So you can just 
uh, put your tab to the QR code and you can see the temperature and humidity data floating above. And that yeah, sort of this demos... one is also um, maybe we can put the link somewhere. Uh, I think I yes, still have I will. A, a really yeah. like bad quality video somewhere on my YouTube channel yeah. on yeah. whenever I put that together. And yeah, again, we're talking 2014, and I think like at the time the the toolkits that were that were available to do augmented reality were actually pretty much on par with 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 what you find today. And it was really interesting to uh, uh, and. That was maybe going slightly overboard, but uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, like augmented reality UI, where you could you could see in real time the the telemetry flowing from the, the the IoT devices was really cool. And we're talking like really early days of Android as well, and so that was based on yeah. Um, and I I don't think that the technology is still around. It was called yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, from what I I mean, I was looking into it recently. My impression is that actually this tool, this toolkit from 10 plus years ago was actually easier to use than <laughs> whatever is available now, uh, sort of like standard in Android and, and iOS. The, the API, I was able to put it together like 10 yeah. years ago when I was still like, yeah, exactly. still a junior developer to some extent. So yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's still out there. Uh, I should figure yeah, out no. whether I can do something similar we'll now. Definitely maybe with purely we'll web, that, uh, like PJS is something that I would like to spend some time. Uh, playing mm. more with and have like something that's purely browser based and get data from websockets sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. Like something using Zephyr perhaps. But yeah, the thing I'm trying to point out here is even by that time, the standards that were available, the open source libraries and the tools that were available, that was such a holistic demo that you could actually just replicate it and scale it to any solution. And we ended up doing that. We actually created a a basic home automation demos and we were students back then we took it to, to hackathons and we were winning crazy amount of money back then just because we had i didn't see yeah, that money yeah uh like uh so was it i don't even remember like to, today or you are a developer advocate for zephyr and back then this designation wasn't even exist i think there were some evangelists there but a lot of uh, things that you were doing was product evangelism and you were till this day almost a decade later you are still doing a lot of uh, similar things. So yeah, that, that speaks volume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, interestingly, like the developer advocate evangelist, like I don't really care all that much at the end of the day. And um, I usually call myself sort of a jack of all trades whenever yeah. it's time to put together like purely slides, like PowerPoint kind of material. If I think that's the right thing to do based on the audience, that's what I would do. If that's more putting together a short video demo or sharing some code on GitHub, either, either way is fine, but, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but interesting that you meant, um, it's interesting that you're mentioning the hackathon stuff, because uh, yeah. I think the same happened with, uh, another project of mine, I guess, the, the artificial nose and like the using tiny ML and like TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers to definitely um, going to talk about it in the, yeah, yeah. And this one, I think I'm pretty sure lots of people got some really good money at hackathons here and there by just uh, building on, on, on top of the open source bits that I put out there, which is fine. I mean, that's actually not fine. It's great. So like, that's, uh, where, what I... where did you get that motivation to put out uh, an open source product example? And that is so polished, that is so packaged in a good way. Everything that anyone can just go take, replicate it, and you know, even maybe build organizations and companies on top of it. Like I have seen open source project, but the dedication that you have put in the demos back then, like that's phenomenal. So what, yeah, well, what is mean, your motivation? It's, it's super rewarding. Just uh, you're a, a great demonstra demonstration of that. And in, in some ways, like, I mean, I've been doing open source and contributing to open source literally since day one in my career. Like, yeah, I won't share. I think uh, actually to almost to this day, uh, I started working 18 years ago. And back then I was already contributing to Eclipse and like Eclipse as in the IDE actually. Um, mm. um, and I got really passionate about engaging in open source. And nowadays, I, I guess my brain is wired in such a way that I really cannot approach any, any other way. Like whenever I have some cool idea, it ends up being shared in public. I guess I'm lucky, uh, like, I mean, this is part of my job to some extent. So I, I still get paid right at the end of the day, I'm paid 
as as a Zephyr um, developer advocate, the project in the Linux Foundation is paying for my salary. But when I was working at Eclipse, same. That's my job to some extent too, and it's it's part of the job to um, to inspire people. And one way is to make sure that there's as little barriers as possible for them to uh, actually do the the reality check. You're telling a story. You're sharing like you're waving yeah. hands like I'm like I am <laughs> since we started. Yeah. Talking about cool technology, but then you need to point people to something tangible. And part of the what's tangible is hopefully what's available as part of the project you're promoting or the technology you're promoting. But whatever demonstrator application you put together, that too needs to be uh, needs to be available not only for people to be able to to use and try out, etc., but also for people to provide like really concrete feedback. Like if you're sharing a a tutorial that just doesn't work or for which you forgot uh, to document properly the instructions to for Mac OS users, whatever, then that needs fixing, right? And one way to make sure that you get that feedback really quickly uh, is to make it open source. Lynn, yeah, 100%. Like, uh, I would say it, it's it's actually very inspirational. Even, even to this day, I just refer back to some of your old blogs from a decade back and it looks so it looks so uh, worked on. I mentioned the greenhouse project. I also remember the IoT holiday lights project that you did run based on Yun. That was very recent that time. I also remember that uh, small robot which which could take Raspberry Pi. You did a lot of streams about it. You wrote a lot of blogs about it. And uh, whenever I sent you an email with a question, you were very quick to respond. So yeah, that was commendable and that was a great contributions to open source i would like to mention but i would love to talk more about technology but i the podcast listener they really want to understand where you come from so if you could give a talk about your career journey how you started how you moved up or what other different things that you worked on in in brief like that would be great yeah not sure where or how far um back i should go but uh, yeah like i sort of started to 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 say uh yeah, I've been working for almost two decades, I guess, in open source. And uh, early on, it was like as part of a, um, a consulting company um, doing a lot of Eclipse-based products. Like one, one thing that Eclipse is actually still great at is building uh, custom IDEs, right, to, to some extent. It doesn't have to be even like programming environments. It could be anything really. And uh, like working on basically writing Eclipse plugins for, for anything and got really passionate about the community and engaging with um, the open source community there, extending the platform by starting to send my first like patches, interestingly, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't know how to use it anymore, but we're talking Bugzilla, which is fine, I guess it's still around, but we're talking CVS, like CVS yeah. and, and later SVN, I guess Eclipse used SVN for a bit, I think, I'm not even sure anymore, but yeah, sending patches in like a in a way that's so different from what we're used to now with github and pull requests and all that so this um, was when you were working for eclipse uh no no that, that, that's actually uh so back then and i think it actually lasted for quite a bit i was with uh, sierra wireless so a company basically still around yeah. i think it's now semtech basically semtech. but uh yeah uh, doing uh, cellular modems and building also a an iot slash m2m cloud platform and so as part of like trying to sell more hardware and i mean we still see that today obviously yeah. Uh, yeah. part of it was also figuring out how to help customers on the software side and so providing them with tools and whatnot sdks and developer environments so that they could actually write their applications nowadays i guess we're more like thinking free autos zephyr etc back then it was more like custom um like silicon and custom um uh, SDKs that, that you would run on, on top of the modules. So yeah, we were building all those tools. And Sierra back then actually made some moves into contributing some of the, the technology they, they were building to the Eclipse Foundation and into, into open source. And so I got to basically get even more involved with the Eclipse community, uh, this time like specifically mm. focusing on IoT and M2M bits. So yeah, I think I was even like a, a chair for, for, for a while of the newly born uh, Eclipse working group, uh, Eclipse IoT slash M2M working group. And um, and yeah, at some point, like I actually realized uh, that there was just so much uh, happening in uh, and around open source IoT, mainly to your point early on, mainly due to MQTT basically taking off like crazy. Yeah. So we're talking 
2010, 2011, IBM had open sourced the, 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 the MQTT implementation they had. The, the protocol was uh, available also as an open specification. Mosquito was available as, as a really good uh, broker, broker for all things uh, MQTT. So there was a lot of like activity basically at Eclipse, MQTT uh, being sort of like the trade brazier, but there were lots of new projects coming in, et cetera. Yeah, so that I, think I, go... I joined as a yeah, developer advocate that's... for helping create a both a story to my point before and a consistent technology stack slash portfolio around the IOT open source project we were starting to get. Paho for MQTT clients, Mosquito for MQTT servers slash brokers, and then everything around it, like uh, gateway. Um, yeah, I think there was like, a lot going on. I, I remember co-op, yeah. uh, some, some clients were yeah, co-op. Yeah, co-op was uh, it's still for... around, actually. Co-op is pretty, yeah. pretty uh, lightweight M2M. So I, yeah. I'm sure not all, all of our audience today is like well-versed yeah. into IoT and connected devices, yeah. but basically all those common building blocks that you need for any IoT slash like connected product, like the communication protocols, MQTT, co-op, et cetera, like all of those, like they are effectively now like open source and open standards because there's just no other way. There's no reason or quite the opposite, actually, no, no reason for making those like proprietary closed, yeah. et cetera. It's quite the opposite. You want interoperability, et cetera. So, uh, yeah. And I think for uh, device management, there was, uh, for LWM2M, there was uh, Kura. I think, uh, yeah, uh, Kura is more like a, a gateway sort of like yeah. application framework. The uh, pure lightweight M2M slash device, device management bits, uh, that would be Leshan, Wakaama. Yeah, Leshan. But yeah, I mean, I mean, long story short, like you said, there's, uh, there were, and there's still uh, lots of projects, uh, under the umbrella of the Eclipse foundation for sure. Yeah. And I think the open hub was also doing uh, good stuff when it comes to home automation and bringing that community together. That was also under Eclipse, right? Uh, yep. 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 Uh, Eclipse smart home slash, uh, open hub due to the, I guess the history of the Eclipse as like in the early thousands, Eclipse being an ID for the Java programming language, a lot of the technology that was coming in was gravitating around Java for better or worse. Like it is, sometimes yeah. it is the right solution might not, but, uh, at the time, like, yeah, things like smart home, Leshan, et cetera, um, lo lots of Java and after that, stuff. Join Microsoft. Talk us about it. Uh, correct. Yes. Uh, so I was with Eclipse for several years and then I needed some fresh air and they joined Microsoft a few months. Uh, yeah, a few months into Microsoft, like I was really sort of like lost because <laughs> moving from a very, I mean, so I'm not saying that Microsoft is not getting open source, actually they're really getting it, but, uh, I was moving from a 40, I think 40 employee open source, not, prof not for yeah. profit foundation to a hundred K plus employees, uh, um, yeah. company, like really huge, so overwhelming. It, so I was, I was lost. <laughs> and, um, uh, luckily, uh, a few months, I guess, into the, the job, I started to find my sort of like own, um, uh, space of doing what I think, what I like doing and what I think I'm good at. And I'm started, I started to do pretty much the same as the greenhouse sort of basic naive sample that you described and that we briefly talked about. I basically did the same at Microsoft, like, and I, it might still be there, but, uh, there's this huge, I mean, Microsoft has, of course, lots of building blocks in Azure specifically, because I was part of the Azure group, lots of building blocks for IOT, for time series databases, for whatever. And so I was trying to create a story where I was trying to find sort of the minimal example of what it takes to do some kind of asset tracking solution. Mm. using Microsoft technology and again, MQTT, et cetera, but like yeah. in a, the simplest way. And so I, I spent a few months doing that and uh, it was really well received because I mean, it re resonated with people because it was, I guess, simple enough, maybe not complex enough to the liking of people who want to sell billions of like, you know, like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, connected assets, et cetera. But yeah. on the other hand, if you want to, like I, I said that already, like if you want to sell billions. You need to start by showing people, users, developers, customers, 
how to um, achieve like the, the minimal hello world sort of scenario. So I did that, and then I guess I, yeah, I, I tried like like I was trying to do with Eclipse as well. And I mean, it's really important in in open source in general, but just like in general, like when you want to uh, when you use technology, it's always going to be you're always going to cherry pick whatever you feel is the right building block again right. for what, what you're trying to accomplish. So just like with um, uh, Eclipse, I was trying to showcase how you can use MQTT in combination with whatever else. AR was a great example. Yeah. At Microsoft, I was doing the same, trying to figure out what if I were to create a solution that, yes, uses Azure for a lot of the data processing, et cetera, but the connection the connectivity aspect would be LoRa, LoRa One. This is not something that's part of the Microsoft portfolio. Yet, if you're building a solution that requires low power um, radio, et cetera, you're going to need, need that anyway. So how is it going to look like to use the Things Network or whatever a LoRa One provider in combination with Azure? Or you're going to need tiny machine learning, tiny ML, because yeah. you want to do AI right at the edge. And Microsoft didn't have anything back then. And yet, uh, TensorFlow Lite for Micro and Edge Impulse, like they were providing really cool tech, which I was trying, yeah, I tried basically to, to so demonstrate. Was this the time, uh, was this the time uh, when you built your uh, artificial nose project? Yep, yep. So um, I think we are talking 2020, 2019. I don't know, like pretty much when COVID hit. Uh, yeah, I, I started playing with, um, I wanted to, and I've told the, this story many times, but I, still worth sharing i've been a software engineer uh one way or the other for a long time and yet ai or rather neural networks is something that i really couldn't get my head around i would open a book and it would talk about how you can like recognize handwritten digits by doing whatever weird stuff on on the pixels etc i it's just i couldn't get it so Right in the middle of COVID, I was like, I was like, hey, you know what? I'm French. I like baking bread. What if I could use technology to improve my bread making skills? Uh, yeah. in, and the idea would be when my sourdough is like sort of like fermenting, there's one point in time where it's supposedly perfect, right? It's like, it's the right amount of bubbling and the, that's the right time when you should be baking the, your baguettes or whatever. And so I was like, hey, maybe, I mean, I can eyeball the thing, I can smell it, but what if I could use technology to do the same and specifically use gas sensors to identify sort of the, the olfactory fingerprint of the, uh, of the sourdough. And so I started to play with, um, with then, but with this more tangible, I guess, use case in mind and with an actual itch to scratch, which was way more tangible than the pixels I was referring to before. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I played a bit with that. And, uh, in a few hours I had some like really good results and started to talk about it. Um, yeah. like I said, I do, right. Like putting it on GitHub and like uh, tweeting about it and whatever. And uh, yeah, it resonated with people. So that was pretty exciting. Yeah. So for the listeners, uh, Benjamin is talking about uh, his artificial nose project, which has uh, a microcontroller or uh, some gas sensors and it's able to detect, uh, when anything you can to, train it yeah um, yeah i think you also did it for uh, identifying the spirits right yeah initially because so, the original idea would have been to um, smell sourdough then bake bread then sort of give uh, based on the uh, i guess subjective quality of the bread this like label my data set to be like hey this when sourdough smells x the bread is like eight out of 10 when it's that input, mm. it smells, etc. But then I right. would have required a lot of time to validate that my idea even worked would have required lots of flowers, which wasn't yeah. even available in the supermarkets uh, at the time, because it was just that crazy time of COVID, right? When yeah. people were piling up on sugar and flour and whatever. So I was like, Hey, what, it, what are, what are some smelly things that I could try an experiment with? And I saw looked for the booze I had around and yeah. uh, it actually worked really well to the point where with just like a few minutes worth of 
data assets and, and, and training data, you could figure out the difference between a different flavors of rum or like between a whiskey that's like really peated versus a more like neat, uh, clean whiskey. So that was really impressive because like even yeah. a human sometimes would struggle with that. And this was very well received in the maker community. Like you also 3D printed uh, a nose like structure to, to hold the project. And it was in front cover of the make magazine. Everyone's talking about it. Very fascinating because people really wanted some interesting machine learning project, which they can actually implement and understand how it actually works, especially the tiny MLs, especially on the edge. So you are definitely going to link that project up as well uh, for people to try it out. I think it was based out on that Seed Studio board that they recently uh, at that time came out with. Yep. I, I think at the time they were, I think Elaine from, from Seed uh, was kind enough yeah. to, to send me an, an early, I mean, maybe not early, but this was really when they launched the, the Wii or Terminal, a really cool um, kind of Arduino-like, I guess, yeah. um, uh, device, but with a really nice form factor and the LCD, um, sort of the infamous groove connector, uh, making it really easy to connect sensors. Yeah, she also sent me one. But yeah, we are talking about the time where, uh, uh, as you were mentioning, that people were uh, initially were hesitant about your demos. It was like, okay, this is not IoT. You need to still scale it. But uh, around this time that we are talking 2020, 2021, there were a lot of platforms so where if you have a proof of concept, if you have one device, the platforms were there to, you know, scale it to 100,000 devices. For microcontrollers, I think of Particle. For uh, Embedded Linux, I think of uh, Balena. Uh, I used to work there, uh, Mender. And I think Goliath, I'm not sure if it was there, but for Artos, so for Zephyr, now they're doing a pretty good job. But now you sort of transition to Zephyr project. So talk us about it, how that happened, and uh, how is it different from working at Microsoft or Eclipse? Because Zephyr is a part of Linux Foundation, the bigger umbrella, the you know champions of open source. So how is it working there when it comes to Zephyr project? Yep. So so, yeah, um, so we are uh, now in yeah twenty uh, September of twenty twenty four. I joined um, early twenty twenty. Three, I joined the Zephyr project. So for those who are not familiar with Zephyr, um, was Zephyr RTOS, as in real-time operating system. It's basically um, um, uh, an embedded operating system, I guess you could call it, similar to free RTOS, to Azure, uh, or Eclipse, I should say, Eclipse ThreadX, and NetX, uh, those really small footprint sort of um, frameworks to help embedded developers not reinvent the wheel. Similar in a way, like from, from a distance to, to what Arduino is, is trying to accomplish, providing a set of APIs that uh, allow you to have write software that, that's portable. Like when you are uh, starting to build very simple, say a smart thermostat, you're going to need to interact with your temperature sensor. You are going to have some kind of, of GUI, et cetera. But especially since we are still sort of in the middle of a silicon shortage of crisis, you don't necessarily want to write software that's going to tie you to a particular temperature sensor, to a particular brand and menu, uh, vendor of microcontroller. It's some kind of abstraction, right? And so that's what basically Zephyr is, is doing. That's what it's been doing for the past eight plus years. It's been an open source project for quite a long time now, and the community has grown pretty, it's actually huge. Like it's literally the, the largest open source community for uh, an Autos by far, like by one, if not two orders of, of magnitude with literally thousands of, of contributors. Every release, like every quarter or every four months, rather we release a new version of, of the project, which yeah, you, you would have contributions from hundreds of, of developers. Yeah. And join basically because the project is now big enough that it actually requires someone, I mean, someone on staff to help with evangelism aspect. So that, that's one, uh, one hat that I'm, that I'm wearing, helping create a story, I guess, again, around whatever new features land in Zephyr, making it easy for people to understand why it matters and how to use them. And also an aspect kind of related in, in a way is looking after the documentation. There's just so much happening in Zephyr that keep keeping the documentation sane and up to date and easy for people to navigate is also part of my uh, duties, which is actually in one way or the other, I've been working on, on documentation aspects for a long time, but it's actually interesting to have it sort of as officially as part of the title, 
you know, as part of the, the duties, because there's, um, yeah, it's, it's a job in itself, familiarly, uh, familiarizing yourself with SEO techniques, even like to, to make sure that people will Google whatever problem they have with, with Zephyr, they get relevant results. It's, it's actually quite, quite exciting to do because you really want to, you put yourself in the shoes of a developer with an actual problem. And I mean, I, myself, when I'm the developer advocate, like when I have that hat on, I'm going to use the documentation, right? To, to, yeah. to create my demo, et cetera. So it better work. And luckily if it doesn't, then I can actually try and improve it. So if I cannot find the code sample that, that I need when it actually exists, then something is wrong and needs to be fixed in, uh, uh, in some place. So, yeah. And I think I can easily say that uh, Zephyr is one of uh, the best open source project when it comes to documentation. It's wide. It has a lot of uh, code examples. Uh, but we also had uh, Jonathan Berry on the podcast, I think, uh, in, in last queue and uh, founder of Goliath. And they do a lot of interesting stuff with Zephyr, allowing companies to build on top of Zephyr, abstracting some tedious bits and scale. And he... You know, we, we together talked about uh, how Zephyr really came to the rescue when there was chip shortage happening. And uh, so when it when it comes to embedded systems uh, and developing on the edge, uh, I see it as a spectrum. So on the one one farther end, it's uh, like uh, developing an embedded C, bare metal. On the other extreme end, I see embedded Linux, uh, a kernel. And, you know, you have uh, a Yocto, you have build road to build uh, whatever packages you want. So where does uh, Artos uh, fits into the spectrum and when should someone decide that I want to go bare metal or I should go Artos? Because uh, especially during the chip shortage time, I have seen that the designs, the companies that were based on the Artos, it was very easy for them to pivot to a new chip without changing the code base much. They can just, you know, almost just uh, take out the existing microcontroller, which has shortage, uh, change it with the one which is available and almost without or to very little changes in the code base, they were able to ship products. Uh, but other than that, and, you know, even if you want to expand on this one, where does Artos fits and how, and like, if you're evangelizing for it, uh, how would you convince someone to start using Artos instead of Embedded C or Linux is a different story, but yeah, anything would you like to add there? Yeah. Um, so first back, back to your point about like the two ends of the, the spectrum. Yeah. Typically, um, bare metal or Artos would be on all things, microcontrollers. And then as soon as you have more processing power, namely an MPU, a microprocessor, yeah. it's likely that you're going to look more at Linux slash embedded Linux. There are exceptions, like you could certainly uh, run um, uh, Zephyr on, on microprocessors as well. There's benefits to that, but um, several ways to answer your question. One way is like some vendors basically would like, I mean, Nordic comes to mind, but there's uh, certainly others. If you want to, if you care about all things uh, Bluetooth, Writing code on top yeah. of a Bluetooth capable MCU, such as what Nordica has to offer, is going to be Zephyr based anyways. The reason is, and to answer the why bare metal versus Arta is that yes, you want to have the hardware abstraction either because you're anticipating some uh, issues due to silicon shortage or, or just because it's like, it's just the best practice. How come in the desktop world or in the cloud slash server world? We think about like containers and using JVMs and like, and Java and whatever to, to have like high level programming languages. How come this wouldn't be possible on, on embedded, right? Like that, that's what an autos is here for all those things that you will keep reinventing when you do bare meal, like manipulating your flash, like, and making sure that you do, uh, you don't wear, wear out your flash and making sure that you have some kind of file system API, so being able to interact with your GPIOs and whatnot to blink LEDs, etc. Yes, it might be fun to do, to do it in bare metal. You're going to learn quite a few things, but it's not going to really advance your, your product in terms of like adding the actual, uh, building business logic, etc. So uh, yeah, all those low level functionalities to create, like have threads and like the ability to, to write, to do concurrent programming, etc. That's what the autos provide you with. And in most instances, it's not really like there's this sort of misunderstanding or this fear that, yeah, it's adding abstraction. So it's going to be bringing you bloat essentially, and, and like, um, killing your performance and like making your embedded software not fit anymore 
in the couple or like dozens of kilobytes you have available, that's actually not true in that whatever logic uh, you need for interacting again with the flash default system, the GPIOs, et cetera, it needs to be there anyways. So either you write it yourself or it's going to be brought by the, the R with like, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, so that's kind of the, the, um, the reasoning there. And, um, another way also to answer the question is like, should I go bare middle or should I go an RTOS? You should really sort of favor going the RTOS uh, route. But what that requires though, is that ideally the RTOS, uh, you're interested in using is already supported on whatever hardware you're aiming for. And so it might or might not be the case based on like which artist you're, you're picking, but with Zephyr, one, one thing that's really cool and really impressive actually, is that it's already like, it supports pretty much every architecture you can think of, like Extensa, AKA ESP32, yeah. uh, ESP32. in short, the, the kind of uh, hardware architectures uh, you see there, like, like Intel, um, ARM, et cetera, RISC-V is a, is a big one. Mm. and and. On top of those architectures, like many SOCs from various vendors, I mentioned Nordic, but you can name them all basically as Pressive, NXP, Analog Devices, ST Micro, and then some, uh, they already have like out of the box, Zephyr runs on their board. So there's really no reason you wouldn't pick Zephyr because it's already there. And you take, you mentioned Zephyr as lots of code samples and it's true, <laughs> there's, there's like maybe too many even. You just take whatever code sample is available to demonstrate how to blink an LED or interact with an SD card and a FAT file system, and you just start there. That's your starting point. Rather than reinventing the wheel, you start building actual code. It's still going to be C most likely, although it could be C++ if you care about it. it could be Rust, that's coming, but uh, you won't be reinventing the boring parts. Right. So yeah, use RTOS, but it's, 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 it's actually funny, like how far we have come. So I remember uh, putting shields on top of Arduinos, arts on top of Raspberry Pi, even if you wanted to have smaller functionality, like Wi-Fi. I remember Texas instrument came out with these, uh, daughter boards and modules, CC 3000, CC 3200. Amazing. Like the community was so good and, uh, you know, everyone was trying to do their bit, even if it's hardware vendors, silicon vendors and middleware. Eclipse IoT, a couple of inflection points where you thought that IoT really took off. For me, I think like ESP was one, but uh, you had a broader picture of the ecosystem because I was in and out of the IoT world. But if there are any couple of inflection points where you think, okay, that happened and from there the IoT skyrocketed, what were, uh, would they well, be? Well, I think, uh, well, you mentioned a few already. Uh, so I'm not sure it's going to be in chronological order, but I guess. Uh, Arduino was first, probably, uh, in, in making, like making, uh, um, electronics, uh, affordable and making NCUs yeah. affordable, uh, like by again, several of their orders of magnitude there too, like even back like 15 plus years ago. Yeah. We were, we we're talking like around 20 euros, 30 euros to get a, to get an Arduino yeah. no, where it would have been at least 10 times more expensive to yeah. get the equivalent from whatever, uh, so and the design was uh, open hardware. So especially yeah. in, in my, in my country, like India, where was it's, it's very expensive to get Arduino. I remember yeah. a lot of uh, local players and China suppliers started yeah, yeah, making exactly. Ar I remember, Arduino clones. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember being in a sort of like a uh, maker space in, in San Francisco in, I don't know, 28, I, I, I wouldn't mm. look it up, but taking a soldering uh, class basically and assembling an Arduino clone, uh, yeah. Same form factor, same, uh, MCU, except that it was, um, yeah, it was a clone. Uh, but yeah, so that, I think that helped in just sort of like making, um, cause like one thing that's part of IOT and that still, I think some people don't really necessarily get, uh, that was also my experience with the artificial nose is the, um, the physical aspect of it. I have sensors. They're going to help me turn physical signals into digital signals. And so. Like, I mean, controlling an LED, yeah. um, sensing a temperature, sensing humidity, I think people get it or like, sort of like, this is something that comes to mind because they have it in their houses with their thermostats and whatnot, but there's more like, and if you look at the Arduino ecosystem or like what Seed Studio has, et cetera, there, like, there's 
dozens, if not more of classes of sensors, right? Like there's gas sensors, color sensors, yeah. uh, like muscle sensors, or like things that you can put on your, yeah. like At actual FSRs. body. Yeah. 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 Um, and so with something like Arduino and everything that, uh, uh, that sort of like spun off, uh, from, from the, the, this sort of approach that really helps with like helping people interact with the physical world and like tackle that aspect. So certainly one inflection point is there uh, and MQTT, like we mentioned, like uh, around the 2010 when it really got yeah. viral basically, and you could still yeah. look up the Google, um, I think Google trends still exist, right. And like trying to look for the, like how much people searched the MQTT keyword in Google, uh, it's like really hockey stick big time, um, around mm. the, the year two, 2010. And so that's what sort of helped, helped people bridge the, um, the physical world that they were starting to be able to, to interact with more thanks to things like Arduino, starting to connect it to, to the internet. And then, yeah, a, a few more things, I guess, um, I mean, ESP32, like you said, Raspberry Pi or yeah. addressing the Raspberry actual Pi. connectivity aspect, right? Cause MQTT, yes, you can run MQTT on your desktop, but you'd rather run it on something that's yeah. more like embedded, I guess, originally in terms of like in chronologically, yeah. a Raspberry Pi probably was first and then I think uh, yes. a lot of uh, samples and products that uh, were, were coming from Adafruit. I think that also has to do a lot with the ecosystem. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, and, and then I guess you had all the pieces with uh, the really small, like Arduino kind of like MCU, the more like Linux gateway sort of um, mm. aspect of it with, with something like Ra Raspberry Pi, um, and QTT. And then, like I mentioned, Artos is like, like Zephyr. It, it's been around for like for many years now, or right? 2016 is when it was open source, but then it, it was actually uh, already used commercially before that, before it was donated in open source. And, um, I guess it took a few years to really take off, but now if you look at like, yeah, the traffic in terms of contributions, the, uh, well, actually that's one interesting factoid that we can share, um, cause it, it might even be launched and be publicly available, uh, for people to order when, um, when we go live with, with the, the podcast, I fix it so yesterday, they announced that so pretty impressive community of people sharing tips and tricks on how to make uh, electronics more, um, sustainable and like repairable, etc. And I just launched a, a soldering station, which is going to be, it's running Zephyr. So there's, I think there's three different microcontrollers in it. And the idea is that you can hook it up to essentially any USB-C power supply. And it has like a web interface. It has like a shell even. It has a, gr a graphical user interface and whatnot. And it's using Zephyr or everything wow. Zephyr is good at, namely what I just mentioned before. USB-C and power delivery and like negotiating, getting the most power out, out of the USB-C power supply. That's something that Zephyr can help with exposing web and HTTP servers and SSH and whatnot, like hotel nets based on Zephyr as well, the GUI so that you have your like tiny LCD display giving you info regarding the yeah. temperature and whatnot. This one is actually really exciting and I don't want to say something wrong, but I think they said that they were. Let me check, uh, but I think they are actually considering making it open source, even like sharing the actual firmware with the world, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Interesting. I was actually about to ask you some of your favorite pro uh, products that are based around Zephyr and you mentioned one, maybe you can share more, but yeah, I also have, uh, this, this concept of, uh, reprogrammable sort of a solder guy that really took off, uh, after COVID I have uh, TS hundred TS 80, I'm not sure. And that's also, yeah. I, I'm not sure if it's running Zephyr, but yeah. I think it could, it it probably could. Yeah. Um, so is this the same TS as in and the guys who also do, uh, electronic, uh, screwdrivers? Yeah. Be yeah, right. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if that one is Zephyr. I'm not sure, but uh, to answer your question, there's what, what's actually exciting is that there's, uh, we mentioned before, like Zephyr or Artos is typically you would find them in MCUs sort of devices, but then it can sometimes extend beyond that. So you can find Zephyr in like the really, really small, really tiny, really constrained, like hearing aids, for example, like there's uh, mm. some Bluetooth uh, capable hearing aids that actually run Zephyr and like the Bluetooth stack that Zephyr has. So there's that. Uh, then you have like the really, really big, as in 
industrial machines like uh, wind turbines and using things like canvas, the industrial protocol canvas to aggregate, collect tons of telemetry in terms of like monitoring the health essentially of the wind turbine to make sure that it's behaving properly mm. and that um, it's efficient and whatnot. And then you have like stuff that's in between. Uh, what, yeah, I mean, one thing that's actually uh, maybe the interesting in that you wouldn't really expect this effort to run uh, there, but uh, are you familiar with the uh, framework laptops? The, yes, the, I am. Yes, right. the, the you German have one company. Are, but th no, those I, are I don't like have one, but yeah. I'm, I'm so, familiar with them, yeah. Yeah, so th this is, um, or uh, and I mean, framework laptops or Chromebooks, uh, by the way, they both share the same open source um, embedded controller, basically. So all the, the stuff that you want your laptop to do whenever Ubuntu or Windows is not running, whenever you're basically in standby mode, you mm. still need to control the charge of the battery. You still need some kind of monitoring of what's happening on the keyboard so that Whenever and someone presses controllers a key, like, yeah. Would, yeah, and so this, like this technology, the embedded controller, uh, is effectively a Zephyr-based open source uh, project. Um, wow! So, Chromium OS, uh, Chromium AC, basically Chromium embedded uh, controller is building on top of Zephyr and can run. Uh, it's basically embedded in in laptops from framework or for for Chromebooks. Wow! Um, I didn't know that. One. Which is really cool, and it's open source. Like you actually have the firmware or the BIOS, I guess, to some extent that that's running on your laptop, it's available out there on GitHub for you to potentially, like, if you feel like you can improve battery management, go ahead and burn your laptop. <laughs> so, yeah. Very interesting. We are coming almost at the end of the podcast, uh, uh, Benjamin. I'm really enjoying the conversation and I can definitely see we doing a part two sometime later because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but before we end this up, uh, I I need uh, you to, you know, share some of the tips for developers to get started with Zephyr. What is the best way? I know a lot of for developers out there uh, who wants to build an IoT product, probably students who are a bit intimidated by Zephyr for some reason. I'm not sure. I attend meetups and people generally seems here intimidated by Zephyr. So what would be your best advice? And uh, what would be your advice uh, in terms of your career journey in, gen in general? Because you had a phenomenal career journey. You inspired a lot of people. So if there's anything that you would like to share to people listening it, how do they, you know, go about making career in IoT embedded and, you know, inspire people? So those are the two wrap up questions, but then I, I feel like I could talk for an extra hour just answering those two. <laughs> I uh, know. No, I mean, the, the getting started with Zephyr part should be a really quick to answer. Like I mentioned, we support hundreds of boards and we have what I think is a really good and reasonably simple a getting started guide. So whatever, hopefully whatever developer kit, electronic boards, you have somewhere sitting on your desk is very likely already supported in Zephyr. Like we're talking, say like the Arduino Uno or it could be a Raspberry Pi actually, could be any dev kit from Nordic STM32, could be an ESP32 stack, whatever. It's likely supported. So you just go ahead and like check out the getting started guide. It's going to help you install the Zephyr, the Zephyr SDK, etc. And you'll get to run your first code samples and then you start learning. If you get into any issues, one thing that really helps is joining the Zephyr community on Discord. Like, like I like to tell people, we've reached the point where there's just so many people on this, on the Discord that whatever is your time zone, if you have a question and drop it there, likely it will at least be acknowledged in, in minutes. Maybe you won't get the answer straight away, but, uh. It's really, really active with thousands of developers there. And something else, like I guess third uh, aspect uh, to, 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 the, to the answer is, especially if you're a student, it makes a lot of sense to be start diving into Zephyr to start building your sort of like expertise around all things embedded and real-time operating systems, et cetera. But you don't want to learn an RTOS, at least in my opinion, just for the sake of learning an RTOS, you need some kind of actual use case. It can be something really simple, but try and identify a problem that you want to solve. Like you don't want to learn threads and semaphores and whatever, yeah. just for the sake of it. Like it's going to be really boring, really abstract. Find something slightly more concrete. Just like, I mean, I said that already, I think with the, why I ended up building the artificial nose stuff. It's because like for 
many years, I really just couldn't learn machine learning and, and neural networks and whatnot by just going through the abstract like textbook sort of material. So yeah, try and think about an actual use case. And for Zephyr, there are many, like it could be, you want to build some kind of Bluetooth beacon, whatever it could be that you, you're going to use ESP32 and you want to create a small web server that exposes some sensor data in your house, whatever. It doesn't have to be crazy complex, but at least it's going to be more than just, oh yeah, I want to try to have a semaphore A and semaphore B and blah. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, so hundred percent. Yeah, I think uh, that's really how I would approach it when when it comes to learning with something more concrete in 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 mind and in in sight. And in terms of career tips, I don't know. I think back maybe again to the artificial nose a sort of like journey and how I ended up, like you mentioned, I ended up being on the cover of Make Magazine, which was like very gratifying in a way, but also actually a really great testimony of one thing that I experienced early on with this particular project is I spent literally like one Saturday afternoon tinkering with gas sensors and with tensor flow, et cetera. And I ended up creating something that very much like felt like an artificial nose, like it was able yeah. to smell things, et cetera. But then hours before. I knew nothing about AI and neural networks, et cetera. So I, I was like, Hey, that's cool. I think I finally understand it a bit more, but surely I'm not the first person who's done something like that. Surely people from the perfume industry or from, uh, agro or whatever, surely they have something similar. I didn't create anything new, like sure. I'm going to like try and tweet about it and whatnot and put my code out there, but it's it's crap. Like I, I felt like that exactly like what you would call the imposter syndrome. Like I was like, yeah, this is mad. Like uh, <laughs> I acknowledge that this is cool. I mean, I find it cool, but surely it's not rocket science. That's actually the, the whole point I was trying to, to, to tell people, but people were really excited about it. And, and then I thought twice and I was like, okay, then if it is indeed something that inspires people, then it's worth telling the story and sharing with the world. And I guess my advice, long story short is, yeah, don't be shy and be more maybe public about what cool things you are working on, because you never know. And yeah. uh, this might inspire people. Uh, and in the long term, it benefits everyone, right? Like if a few years back when I, I sort of like created this artificial nose, if people had no idea that this was even possible. Like I had people from, again, the perfume industry and cosmetics and whatnot, reaching out like senior chemists and senior engineers and whatnot, pinging me and being like, can I buy this? And I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> then, I, I mean, we have a problem like that. I'm, I don't want to like overdo it, but, uh, the humanity at large or the industry at large has an issue if those like things are not more common knowledge because people just assume that it is a complicated topic when maybe it's not right. And so it helps to be, um, to be more open in that sense. And I mean, yeah. open source in general is a great uh, demonstration of that. And you see that every day in the Linux community, in the Zephyr community and anywhere really like just people share things that 100%. they think might be trivial. They might not be. Never yeah. I mean, it's safe to say that, uh, start by solving your own problems and build in public that, that goes a long way. All right. Uh, this was really fun. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, I have to build now an artificial nose for my wife because she's a baker and she always struggled with sourdough starters. So I know what my next project gonna be, but I'm going to leave you with the one uh, interesting thing. And, you know, I think that will bring smile to your face because back when we were in university, we wanted to show some cool demos. We automated a tube light or or a LED bulb in our homes. And uh, we wanted to show that we are in the university and we can control that. So usually people go by the route of port forwarding and, you know, talking to your ISP. That was a really hard thing. And that was a scary thing to do. So uh, Eclipse IoT back then had, uh, had uh, the mosquito broker available on public server as a sandbox. And that is something that we used to, you know, just uh, avoid port forwarding. And we use that sandbox server to do our experiments with that. 
so yeah a lot of interesting thing that you have been involved on lot lot of things to be proud on proud about but uh, we definitely be getting you back for a part 2 of this podcast lot to talk about but uh, thank you for your time today benjamin it was uh, really fun uh, i'm i'm really happy to do this uh, again and uh, i hope you had a great year ahead see you again soon thanks